Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Well, hello everyone and welcome to this evening's event at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm David Kennedy. I'm a professor emeritus of history at Stanford University and the former director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West at Stanford. And it's my considerable pleasure this evening to be here with uh, my colleague, uh, Philip Taubman. Phil has been a lecturer at Stanford University's Center for International Security and Cooperation. He was a longtime editor and p reporter and bureau chief at the New York Times, and he's the author of the book we'll be discussing this evening, In the Nation's Service, The Life and Times of George P. Schultz. So Philip is here to discuss not only his uh, book, but the life and times of George Schultz more broadly. Uh, and this work uh, treats uh, George Schultz's long career in public service at the uh, Bureau of the Budget, later Office of Management and Budget, uh, Secretary of Labor, Secretary of the Treasury, and eventually Secretary of State, one of only two people, if my memory serves, who held that many cabinet or cabinet equivalent uh, positions. And of course, after he left formal government service, he also had a major role to play in an effort to reduce or even eliminate a nuclear weapons. So I'm looking forward very much to this discussion with uh, Philip this evening. So a reminder to our audience, uh, if you're with us here in San Francisco, and you have a question for Philip, please write it on the question card that you'll find, if you haven't already found it, uh, on your seats. And if you're watching uh, along with us uh, on uh, uh, streaming, uh, please put your questions into the text chat function on YouTube or on your internet service or streaming service, and we'll be getting to audience questions later uh, in the program. So let me begin on what might be a little bit of an embarrassing note, Phil. Um, I have to say, I found this book to be uncommonly interesting, and not just because it's an interesting subject, namely George Schultz, but I was really at many points in awe of the extent and depth of your research and of the felicity of your writing. So it's a particular pleasure to be here with you this evening and to talk about this really quite terrific book. So let's begin with you, okay? Where were you born, where were you raised, uh, what was your educational formation, what was your career, and what led you, what was the pathway that led you to this particular project? You've written other books, to be sure, but what got you to this one? Well, thank you, and thank you for those kind words, David. Coming from you, that means a lot. Uh, so I'm a New York kid, uh, grew up in Manhattan, uh, went to high school there, came out here to Stanford University uh, as an undergraduate. Uh, and when I put my uh, luggage down in my freshman dorm, the first place I headed was the offices of the Stanford Daily, uh, <laughs> because I wanted to be a journalist. Uh, that was probably because my father was a journalist, worked at the New York Times for 40 plus years uh, as a music critic and a drama critic, and I got the bug uh, <coughs> traveling around the world with him. Uh, and so I did go into journalism. Uh, first at Time Magazine, uh, and then uh, a brief period at Esquire, and then eventually the New York Times. Uh, and increasingly got drawn into reporting about national security affairs. Uh, and that's where I first met George Schultz, uh, was when he was Secretary of State, and I was uh, helping to cover the State Department for the New York Times Washington Bureau. Uh, and that began a relationship with him, uh, that was kind of suspended uh, after uh, he uh, left office in early 89. I observed him in the Washington Bureau and then I moved to the Moscow Bureau of the Times and uh, in those days he was traveling back and forth once Mikhail Gorbachev became the Soviet leader, so I observed him there. Uh, we played tennis a few times. 
Uh, who, who won? Well, uh, that's a good question because <laughs> the first time when he, his aide told me to bring a racket on the next trip and we found ourselves in, in Rio and one afternoon and I got a call up in my hotel room and said, the secretary would like to play tennis. So off we went to the tennis court and, uh, you know, we're volleying and I'm thinking to myself, am I allowed to beat the Secretary of State? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it turned out he was a very steady player like the man himself. Uh, but at any rate, I, I was in Moscow. He left office. I came back and, and we sort of fell out of touch. Uh, what actually led to this book project uh, was the prior book that I did on Schultz, Bill Perry, Henry Kissinger, and Sam Nunn, and Sid Drell down at Stanford, and their effort to eliminate nuclear weapons. And it was during the course of <clears throat> doing that book that Schultz said to me one day, how would you be interested in writing my biography? What was the title of the book you did on those five? Uh, the Partnership, yeah. Five Cold Warriors and Their Quest to Ban the Bomb. Yeah, another excellent book, by the way. So, the, uh, crucial points, your own career in Schultz's overlapped and gave you insight not only to the world of Washington, D.C., where you were bureau chief, if I'm not mistaken. Eventually, I became <coughs> Washington bureau chief of the Times, correct? And you were bureau chief in Moscow as well? Correct. Yeah, okay. So did that give you any particular perspective on the U.S.-Russian relationship? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, when you cover in those days, uh, here were the two superpowers, and I had the, <coughs> the privilege of uh, writing about the Cold War, first from Washington and then from Moscow. And uh, I think when I got to Moscow uh, with my wife, Felicity Barringer, who at the time had been working for the Washington Post, we were both struck uh, very quickly by how uh, kind of uh, depressed the Soviet economy was. Uh, you know, it was a centrally planned economy. It was sputtering when we got there. A huge investment was being made in the uh, defense, uh, you know, for the Kremlin. Uh, and it became clear after a month or six weeks that it, the Soviet Union was really a developing country with nuclear weapons. Uh, and so that helped me understand the Cold War in a way I would not have before. And I think it, it helped me understand something that became important for Schultz and Reagan uh, and then figures prominently in the book, which was one of the motivations for Mikhail Gorbachev to wind down the Cold War was that he understood, unlike his predecessors, uh, that the Soviet economy could not sustain that kind of military expenditure and provide any kind of consumer goods for the Soviet citizens. Um, so let's say that we could revive George Shultz and bring him into the room here tonight. It'd be your job to introduce him, make us understand him as a human being. What made him tick? What was his own formation? What was he like? What kind of guy was he? Well, you know, the George Schultz I knew was, uh, turned out to be several different people in a, in a way. That had less probably to do with him than the perspective I had on him. So when you're covering the Secretary of State as a reporter for the New York Times, you're, you're kept at a distance. You travel with the Secretary, travel around the world with him, uh, but your access is limited and it's very much controlled. And so what you're seeing is the persona that the State Department and the Secretary want to project. And the, that persona of George Schultz uh, was a, a very reserved person, uh, very few words, tried not to make news when he was uh, talking to reporters. Uh, his nickname around the uh, State Department in those days uh, was the Sphinx because he was so quiet and he, he was a good listener, uh, but he was not a, a gregarious person. Fast forward to the time I'm dealing with him for the research for the book, seemed like an entirely different person. Gregarious, outgoing, <coughs> fun-loving. Uh, I think this was clearly partly a function when you're Secretary of State, you keep a certain demeanor. His first wife had died by, uh, you know, by the time I renewed my relationship with him. And his first wife, Obi, was a, was a, a wonderful, thoughtful, uh, but very quiet and modest person. When he remarried, 
and people in San Francisco will know his second wife very well, Charlotte. She was the chief of protocol for San Francisco and the city and the state of California. And nobody knew how to th throw a party better than Charlotte. Uh, and George her as quiet and reserved. And so George kind of <laughs> adopted this kind of party loving mode that Charlotte presented. And the second George Schultz I met was a very playful person, uh, liked to joke around, dance, you know, uh, sing. So, you know, when you ask the question, I have to answer it in the sense that I saw him transition from this very reserved figure to this very outgoing figure. You make me recollect that when he came back to Stanford after leaving office, <clears throat> among many other occasions that he organized was a reception for Edvard Shevardnadze. And to honor Shevardnadze on that occasion, George got up and sang a cappella, Sweet Georgia Brown. Since <laughs> Shevardnadze was from, he was awful. I mean, it was just terrible singing. But that, but that was a side of him that you wouldn't have seen when he was secretary. No, but actually, it turned out he did exactly that when he was secretary of state. <laughs> uh, because, the, you know, to talk a little bit about Schultz as a diplomat, he wanted to establish a rapport with the people that he was dealing with. And, you know, it was almost impossible to establish rapport with Andrei Gromyko, the longstanding <laughs> Soviet foreign minister, who was this implacable, you know, uh, belligerent figure. Once he was replaced by Edward Chevernadze, who came from Georgia, you know, which is, a, 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 it's not on the Mediterranean, but the people of Georgia are m kind of a Mediterranean people. They're warm, friendly, they love to have dinner parties, drink their wine and their cognac. Uh, and Schultz developed this wonderful relationship with Shevardnadze, which, you know, actually when you go back and look at the end of the Cold War, it was that relationship between the two foreign ministers that was, I think, as almost as important as the relationship between Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. And so at one point, when they're negotiating uh, at the height of the Cold War, he did exactly that with Shevardnadze. He, he, he <coughs> arranged to this lunch where he sang Georgia on My Mind. They did a uh, version in Russian, uh, and Shevardnadze loved it. I wish I'd heard that. <laughs> that would have been memorable. But he, you know, before he entered government service, he had another career as an academic. He was trained right. as an economist at MIT, taught there for a while, then went to Chicago. So tell us a little something about the academic side of his career. And, you know, uh, Schultz always thought of himself as an academic. So uh, when the war ended, he'd been a Marine in World War II uh, in the Pacific Theater, was involved in, in, in combat. Uh, he came back, uh, took up a admission that had been approved before he went off to the war to uh, do graduate work at MIT in economics got his PhD there, became an assistant professor there. Uh, and interestingly, uh, one of the courses he took was with Paul Samuelson at MIT, who was a young rising star in economics. And, and a Keynesian. Uh, yes, a Keynesian. Uh, and uh, because it was a post-war period, George Schultz took a course from Paul Samuelson it was just George Schultz and one other student in the course. Talk about a seminar. Wow, that's amazing. So he then moves to Chicago. And Milton Friedman and the whole Chicago School of Economics, which is free market economics, uh, and he became a disciple of free market ec economics. I tried to get him to explain to me later in life, and I, I, he never really gave me a satisfactory answer, you know, how he had moved from taking Paul Samuelson's course and, and thinking the world of Paul Samuelson, and then ends up at Chicago, you know, being the sort of opposite of a Keynesian econ uh, economist. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> the Chicago School is famous, exactly. the anti-Keynesian. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Uh, but he, he, he was not able to explain adequately to you, how he made that well, intellectual you know, transition. I think uh, he was persuaded, and it's interesting to think <coughs> back, uh, you know, during the Depression, George was uh, a young man, uh, and Franklin Roosevelt, David knows this better than anybody, as having written a wonderful book about FDR. You know, all the efforts that FDR made to revive the American economy during the Depression, 
which I think most Americans looked at and thought he was making progress and doing the right thing, not George Shultz. <laughs> Uh, as a young man, he looked out at the American economy and came to the opposite conclusion, which was that for all FDR was doing, it wasn't working. And so at that point in the 1930s, he became a Republican. He became convinced that government intervention in the economy was essentially a bad idea. And he carried that through to his dying day. Uh, you know, he remained very much a, a member and leading light of the Chicago School of Economics. Yeah, and he, and he thought anyone who believed otherwise wasn't a true economist. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So Richard Nixon is the person who first elevates him into significant public office. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, he appoints him to his first three cabinet posts at OMB, Labor, and Treasury. Right. So tell us a little bit about his career there in the Nixon. So, you know, it's interesting. He, Schultz made a name for himself as a labor economist. Uh, and then uh, after a number of years as dean of the Chicago uh, University, University of Chicago Business School, he took a sabbatical, came out here. This was his first contact with Stanford University. The, the Center for Advanced Studies. Center for Advanced Studies. And he, they introduced him to his office in the foothills overlooking the campus. and. He looks in his office, there's no telephone. And he goes to the director and he says, what's up? You know, I use the telephone all the time. There's no phone in my office. And the director says, no, we do not have phones in offices here. I think you'll come to find that you like that. And he did. <laughs> uh, but he did get a call from Richard Nixon. Uh, must have been in the main office. Uh, and Nixon, who was campaigning for president, invited him to provide some advice. His mentor and connection to Nixon, interestingly, was Arthur Burns, who later became chairman of the Federal Reserve. George Shultz had gone to Washington in 1955 to work on the staff of the Council of Economic Advisors in the Eisenhower White House, and the chairman of the council was Arthur Burns. That's where their relationship began. Nixon's elected in 68, and he invites Schultz to come be his Secretary of Labor. And Schultz goes down to LA to meet with the president-elect, and he finds Nixon to be a kind of odd duck in a way. Hmm. He's there, he thinks, being interviewed for this job, even though it's already been offered. But he figures Nixon wants to figure out you know, exactly what kind of labor secretary are you going to be. It turned out, according to Schultz, that Nixon seemed very insecure during the interview. Uh, and he always remembered that, interestingly. So he becomes secretary of labor. The day comes when he is announcing all the sub-cabinet officials in his department. <coughs> There's a news conference in New York, I think it was. He goes down the list, he gets, announces seven or eight people, not a single one of them is a Republican. <laughs> They're all Democrats or independents. It had never occurred to him, because he was not a particularly political figure, that when you're staffing up in a Republican administration, the expectation is that you're gonna appoint Republicans. And so he got an a angry phone call from a Nixon aide after that, essentially saying, George, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> you know, you're appointing all these Democrats. Secretary of Labor, his greatest achievement, and most people don't even know about this, was that George Shultz led a task force in the Nixon administration to desegregate urban public school systems in the South. And when they started that project, Less than 25% of the urban school systems in the southern states were desegregated. By the time they finished, 75% were. So this was an amazing achievement by George Schultz that has kind of been lost to history because he became famous as Secretary of State. Somewhat better known is the Philadelphia Plan, and also, which was also uh, an initiative in this same direction. Exactly. He helped to desegregate the, uh, you know, the trade unions, uh, the plumbers, the electricians, and all of those unions, uh, which were mostly 
you know, occupied by white men in those days. And George Shultz believed in civil rights. He believed in equality. He wasn't a fervent believer. You know, Martin Luther King was leading marches in Chicago when he was a dean at the University of Chicago. He wasn't out there marching. But what he did do was to shake up the University of Chicago admissions process so that they could bring in more people of color uh, to the business school. And then he did this effort with the tr <coughs> building trades and then with the southern uh, school systems. You tell a touching story about a trip he made to Fort Worth, Texas in 1962 and a confrontation in the hotel lobby over a black person trying right. to get a room. So at this point, the uh, meatpacking industry was going through a, a huge transformation. It, historically, uh, the, the stockyards had been based in places like Kansas City and Chicago, and the cattle had been driven you know, to them from, from the farms where they were raised. The industry figured out this was not very efficient uh, and that they should disperse the stockyards out closer to the places where the cows were being raised, which required an upheaval. And the, the, the union was a heavily black union at the time, places like Chicago and Kansas City. And they were threatened by this because the workforce out closer to the farms was not going to be predominantly black. So George was brought in to help figure out how to make this transformation without costing a lot of jobs to black union members. So he shows up in Dallas, Fort Worth, I guess it was Fort Worth that day, uh, with his aide from the University of Chicago. And this is when he's dean. He's dean and a black union representative. They arrive at the hotel desk and they check in and the clerk checks in George Schultz, checks in his aide. They get to the black uh, union leader. I'm sorry, we don't have a reservation for you. So Schultz says, what do you mean? We made reservations for three people. We're sorry, Mr. Schultz, we don't have a reservation. So he says to them, uh, check your records. They come back out, they said, we don't have a reservation. He says, put them in my room, they are two beds. They go back and they consult again and they find a room. <laughs> so, you know, it was a, it was a wonderful kind of courageous thing a, a human thing for George Schultz to do. But as you say, he wasn't conspicuous in the he, public he, eye. He was not a fervent advocate of civil rights, but he quietly did things that advanced the interests of people of color in the United States. What about, well, he was a treasury in the next administration. Any landmark accomplishments there? Well, there is a, a, a landmark accomplishment that we all still enjoy today, which was uh, the, the, in, the exchange rate for international currencies when he became Treasury <coughs> Secretary was pegged to the dollar, which was pegged to the price of American gold reserves at Fort Knox, $35 an ounce. <laughs> it was unsustainable because dollars were circulating in far greater amounts than the gold reserves were available to back them up. So Nixon realized they had to do something drastic, and he asked Schultz to design a new exchange rate system, which George did. And so the floating exchange rate system, which still exists to this day, was uh, basically his creation. How did he get along with Nixon personally? Uh, good and bad relations. Uh, to, you know, he thought Nixon was doing good things domestically. And in fact, when you go back and look at the Nixon administration, you know, the uh, Environmental Protection uh, Agency was created by Richard Nixon. Nixon was progressive on some domestic issues. Uh, he got involved in, in the desegregation issue because he realized Nixon that the Supreme Court had mandated this. Uh, but Nixon also, of course, was responsible for the Watergate burglary and the cover-up and the Watergate scandal. And George got drawn into this himself in a way that he didn't want to talk about. Uh, Not even to you. No. So people remember that John Dean, the White House counsel, went to the IRS in this period and presented them with a list of dozens of names of Nixon's enemies. And John Dean said to the IRS commissioner, a, a South Carolina gentleman named Johnny Walters, uh, 
we want the IRS to investigate all of these people. Walters was offended. He went to the Treasury Secretary, George Schultz, who agreed. They put the list in a safe. Schultz instructed Walters, if John Dean calls you back, tell him to call me. So that's great. But what he didn't want to talk about was that Nixon leaned on him to have the IRS investigate Larry O'Brien. So you may remember, what the Watergate burglary took place to break into the offices of Larry O'Brien, the chairman of the Democratic National Committee. Nixon believed O'Brien was a very effective political operative for the Democratic Party. He wanted the IRS to find uh, tax problems for Larry O'Brien. And sadly, George Shultz condoned that. The IRS went into a frenzy of investigating Larry O'Brien for his connection to Howard Hughes, the m m billionaire, uh, you know, who was holed up at the top floor of his Las Vegas hotel because he feared that if he met anyone outside his hotel suite, he would get sick. So George condoned that, and uh, I found uh, the, the records of these were found by a wonderful research assistant I had at Stanford. And when I sat down with George to look at all the records of the special prosecutor of Watergate that detailed all of this, he looked stricken. Hmm. Uh, I was actually concerned he might have a heart attack in the, in the interview hmm. because he was so upset to have us ask him about this. Uh, so, you know, I, I would say looking back at his record as Secretary of Treasury on economic issues, he accomplished a, a lot, but he got drawn into Watergate in a way that he should not have. You, you write that he was the last of the Nixon appointees to resign, which I don't think is quite right, because I think Kissinger stayed to the end, I believe. Right. But, it, but he was Kissinger among, he didn't was among start the in the Nixon cabinet. Kissinger started as the National Security yes, Advisor, so Schultz was the last person appointed to the Nixon cabinet initially who stayed. Okay. Yeah. And you think he had some regrets about well, that? Well, he told Arthur Burns he uh, should leave. If you go back, you know, one of the wonderful things about doing research for a project like this is you find all this historical material. And lo and behold, Arthur Burns did a, a memoir and kept a diary. I, I think most people didn't realize that. I certainly didn't. So there in his diary, he has entries talking about his private conversations with the Treasury Secretary, George Shultz. And Shultz is confiding in him that, you know, that Nixon is deeply involved in Watergate, it's criminal conduct, he's uncomfortable working for Nixon, uh, but he, he, he won't quit. He didn't quit until May of 74. Nixon resigned in August of 74. He stayed, he stayed too long. There's a pattern here, it seems to me, reading your book, that he, on several occasions, threatened to resign, both the Nixon administration and the Reagan administration, but never did. And he stays on even when things are starting to look a little shady. But we'll, we'll get to that because it's another part of the story right. that really comes into better focus a little bit later. Let's, let's move to uh, what I suppose is his most famous and consequential period of service, which was as Secretary of State <coughs> in the Reagan administration. Uh, you commenced that discussion with a, a nice kind of uh, concise history of the state of the Cold War at that moment, and you rest a lot of the argument on National Security Decision Directive 32, which I think is dated 1982, if I remember correctly, which that document kind of summarizes the state of <coughs> the Reagan administration's dominant uh, policy thinking about relations with the Soviet Union and the Cold War generally. So you want to set the scene for us there, what it looked like when, when um, George came in? Sure. So... I think you have to remember the key thing is the, at the beginning of the Cold War, the United States adopted the doctrine of containment. This doctrine was the creation of George Kennan, who was the U.S. ambassador in Moscow after the war ended. Uh, and his theory, which was consistently adhered to through most of the Cold War, was that we have to contain the Soviet Union militarily, economically, politically, because it's, it's an expansionist power. Uh, and, and that had been the <coughs> doctrine guiding presidents beginning you know, with Harry Truman. Reagan comes into office, and he 
essentially wants to not only double down on containment, he wants to do something different. He doesn't want to just contain the Soviet Union. He wants to roll back Soviet advances around the world. And that's the core of this national security uh, memo that you describe. And the, his, fra the phrase rollback goes back at least as far as John Foster Dulles. Yes. That's not a yeah, but, you know, it, Reagan was really determined to do it. Uh, and he came in to office uh, with this belligerent rhetoric about the Soviet Union, the evil empire. Communism is going to wind up on the ash heap of history. Very aggressive rhetoric about the Soviet Union. A huge military buildup. Uh, supported by Congress, Democrats and Republicans. Remember, it's the height of the Cold War. And so the whole strategy is to throw the Soviet Union back on its heels. Alexander Haig, Reagan's first Secretary of State, believes in this. But there's a very interesting moment early in the Reagan presidency. Leonid Brezhnev, the Soviet leader, writes a boilerplate letter to Reagan that talks about, you know, we need to find peace and, and uh, you know, try to reduce tensions. The State Department looks at the letter and said, uh, yeah, you know, this is just the usual, you know, propaganda from the Kremlin. They write a response that's a boilerplate American response. They give it to Reagan. He looks at it. He says, I, that's, I don't want to send that letter. He sits down and he writes by hand his own letter to Brezhnev. And it is a, an amazing letter when you go back and look at it. it. It is the letter of a naive idealist. It's a letter that talks about how we must have peace between our peoples, and there's no need to have this tension. It was, it was a reflection of an inner Reagan uh, that was not visible publicly, really, at this time. And so he hands this letter to the State Department. They go back, they rework their letter a little bit. They send back their letter to the president to say, we want to send this letter to Brezhnev. And he says, OK, here's what we're going to do. You're going to send your letter, and you're going to send my letter. And they did it. And the people around Reagan, Haig and others, Cap Wine, they all thought this is crazy. What is the president doing writing a kind of soporific letter like this to the, to the Soviet leader? So Schultz comes to town. And he doesn't really understand this kind of core idealism. He comes to replace Haig. Yes, replaces Haig, who's fired because, uh, you know, remember the day Reagan was shot and, and Vice President Bush was out of town and Haig goes into the White House press room and announces to the world, I'm in charge here. You know, it was, seemed like a usurpation of power. Uh, anyway, uh, Reagan fires Haig, brings Schultz in, who has very little foreign policy experience, uh, and makes him Secretary of State. But what Schultz had, which I think you'll see in the book, uh, he was aligned with Reagan in ways that the two men didn't understand when their relationship began. Schultz had gone to the Soviet Union uh, during the Nixon administration. And Schultz believed in experiential learning, basically. He believed you could tell more with your eyes and ears than you could often learn from uh, intelligence reports. Uh, and so he went to the Soviet Union with his wife. She goes to a hospital. She had been a nurse during World War II. She comes back and she says to her husband, it's unbelievable. It is like a medieval hospital. There are no sanitary, no hygiene. There are multiple peop operating tables in the same room. She fills him in on the meager, bleak state of medicine in the Soviet Union. He goes to a Black Sea resort. And what do they do when they're there? They take him to a czarist palace that they've restored. And the guide with Schultz says, we wanted to show this to you so you'll understand that the communist leaders of this country invest in things other than defense. He looks at that and he says, wow. Isn't that an interesting insight into this country? So what Schultz understood viscerally and Reagan under, understood kind of intellectually, because he'd read about it, was that the Soviet Union was a failing state economically. And so 
As Secretary of State, he believed they had an incentive, the Kremlin, to try to ease tensions, and he wanted to ease tensions. So his great, among his adversaries inside and around the uh, adjacent, let's say, to the Reagan administration was the so-called Committee on the Present Danger, and at least one of the members of that I knew a bit, uh, Richard Pipes. Um, so tell us a little bit about them and how effective they were in trying to counter the Schultz view. They were very effective. So Schultz shows up in Washington and becomes Secretary of State. He really doesn't have a relationship with Reagan uh, apart from uh, discussions they'd had over economic policy issues. As I said, he doesn't really understand what Reagan wants to do with the Soviet Union. Everything that he's seen and heard is, is harsh conf confrontation. So he tries to get FaceTime with the president. Uh, and if you spend any time in Washington, one of the things you learn very quickly is that the Secretary of State is only as effective as his or her relationship with the president. <coughs> Schultz didn't really have much of a relationship with Reagan, so he wanted to establish one. So he keeps asking to have meetings with the president one-on-one. -on -one. And every time something's arranged, he goes over to the White House and he walks into the Oval Office or the Cabinet Room, and it turns out there are a dozen people there, most of them opposing his proposals to try to ease tensions and open a diplomatic uh, communication with the Kremlin. It's interesting you mentioned Richard Pipes. He was a Harvard professor, an expert on the Soviet Union. He had come down to Washington to work on the national security staff, and he thought that Schultz, George Schultz was in way over his head. Uh, and when I went back and read Richard Pipes's book and his accounts of the presidency, he's incredibly dismissive of George Schultz. As, as was Haig. Yeah, as was Haig, as a lightweight. Just an economist. Yes, you know. Haig at one point said to Schultz, you know, basically, I don't know how you're going to do this job, you're just an economist. <laughs> Uh, and Pipes was very uh, dismissive. So at one point, Schultz goes over to a meeting with Reagan, and he, he looks around the room, and Pipes is sitting there. And as, as Schultz later described it to his aide, who, by the way, kept this amazing diary of, of all of this, which plays a large part in the book, Schultz looks around the room, and he sees Pipes there, and he turns to Reagan, and he says, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> and then what? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, it turns out it was Pipes who was opposed to everything he wanted to do. So Schultz would come back to the State Department and say to his aide, uh, Ray Seitz, you know, uh, how is it that the Secretary of State cannot have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the President of the United States to talk about U.S.-Soviet relations? <laughs> <laughs> so eventually, Reagan and Schultz align. But again, as you presented, that took a lot of work on Schultz's part. And Reagan appears, at least in your account, as sort of the passive or sub subordinate partner in this enterprise. And you make a great deal of a dinner they had a, during a Washington, D.C. blizzard where Nancy Reagan connected with Schultz. Yeah, so if you look back at history, you're, you're the historian here. Uh, you know, it was so stunning to me to see that the end of the Cold War began in many ways uh, thanks to Mother Nature and thanks to Nancy Reagan. Uh, because there was this huge blizzard in Washington in February of 1983. My wife and I were living there at the time and you know, two to three feet of snow fell. I remember we went out and people were skiing on Wisconsin Avenue in Georgetown. It was, the traffic was dead stopped. Nobody was moving. The Reagans had planned to go to Camp David. They couldn't get there. So Nancy Reagan took advantage of the blizzard. She was concerned that her husband was being depicted as a warmonger, that his legacy was going to be raising tensions during the Cold War rather than reducing them. So she saw this opportunity at the blizzard, picked up the phone, called the Schultzes, said, come over to dinner. They did. And that dinner was a turning point. What's the date again? It was early February, 83. And for the first time, Schultz has now been Secretary of State for seven or eight months. He has a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the president and, and with Nancy and with Obi. Uh, and he realizes that night that he and the president actually share this kind of desire to wind down the Cold War. Uh, 
And from that day forth, even though it took him several more years to essentially gain control of U.S. foreign policy, he knew the president and he agreed. And so as all of this flack was thrown up around him to try to prevent the policies he was advocating from being advanced, he knew that eventually, he hoped at least, Reagan would move aggressively in his favor, which he eventually did. Let me remind the audience, both here and the streamers, that you have uh, questions. If you have questions to submit, please uh, hand them in the room here to anybody who's going to collect them and send them in by whatever chat function you have if you're streaming. And we'll do our best to get the questions to fill and uh, to answer them to the best of our ability. Let me ask you a kind of a big, maybe unanswerable question at this stage of the game, but let's try to tackle it anyway. There's a school of thought that Reagan came into office with this notion that he could spend the Soviets into oblivion and challenge them technologically with the Strategic Defense Initiative, or Star Wars, and this would make it clear to them they could not compete any longer and they would have to throw in the towel. In your book, I don't quite get that sense of that that's a proper narrative, that without Schultz's presence in that uh, scenario, uh, the, the story could have ended very, very differently. And it comes into focus, it seems to me, to a certain extent at least, at the famous meeting in Reykjavik, uh, in Iceland in 1986, when there was a real chance to end the technological competition in, in space and take a gigantic step toward reconciliation between the Soviet Union and the United States. So what, 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 do, you, do you buy that, that narrative, which is quite well formed in some quarters, or do you think it needs qualifying? I think it needs qualifying, uh, and I hope my book qualifies it in, in the following way. There's no doubt that Reagan came into office determined to uh, confront the Soviet Union, as I said, to throw the Soviet Union back on its heels. Major defense spending, and then the announcement of the Strategic Defense Initiative, was, which was, was this technologically exotic space-based shield that would, in theory, uh, knock down all incoming Soviet ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads. So he did succeed in putting the Kremlin on the defensive. What he didn't know how to do until George Shultz showed up was how to translate that into an effective <clears throat> diplomatic strategy. And I think absent George Shultz, no matter what Ronald Reagan's overarching strategy was when he came to Washington, he would have had a hard time succeeding in winding down the Cold War absent George Shultz as Secretary of State. Let me, let me share a story that I think I've mentioned to you before uh, and, and just ask you a question about it. So when, when George came back from public service, as I say he was on the Stanford campus, and among the things he did for several years, he convened an annual conference organized around the statesmen who ran the world in his era. So um, more than once I attended these occasions and the format was there'd be a very nice dinner and maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 people in the room, and then his invited guests each get, had 10 minutes to get up and give their view of the world. So I can remember on one of these occasions, the speakers were, through the evening, Giscard d'Estaing, the former president of France, Lee Kuan Yew from Singapore, Oscar Arias from Costa Rica, Jeffrey Howe from um, uh, Costa Rica, Britain, Britain. From, the, from the UK, and Oscar Arias, and Helmut Schmidt. Right. They each gave 10 minutes, their, state of the their view of the state of the world, and one was more impressive than the next. I mean, they were really senior, serious statesmen who really had sophisticated views of the world. So a day or two or three later, I ran into George on campus, thanked him for including me on in this occasion. I said, you know, I can't help asking if your former boss, Ronald Reagan, had been on the program that evening and asked to get up and give his 10 minute view of the world, how would he have compared with those very impressive gentlemen who got up and spoke? And his reply to me was, David, he said, I've been in the room with Ronald Reagan and every one of those people, and he dominates every single one of them. I did not take that at face value at the time, but uh, you, you know more about his view of Reagan than I do. I, 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 well, so that's the question. What, what, what did George think of Ronald Reagan? Well, he idolized Ronald Reagan uh, to the day he died. Uh, and I, I think I understand that, 
to some extent because uh, the two men, once they forge this uh, working relationship and, and once Reagan came to understand the value that Schultz brought to the table as a, as a diplomat, the two of them proceeded to wind down the Cold War with Gorbachev and Shevardnadze. Uh, but what George forgot when he told you that uh, and you can see it in the site's diary day after day after day. It's in, in, in uh, uh, detail, wrenching detail at times, is how often Schultz was disappointed by Reagan. Uh, and he was disappointed because he couldn't get Reagan uh, to intervene to try to settle this internecine warfare that was going on in the Reagan administration. He couldn't get the president to stick to decisions that he had made. So for example, there are cases where Schultz thought that the president had agreed to do something and then it was undone by other aides uh, because Reagan wasn't paying attention or because the White House chief of staff or the national security advisor wasn't following up on the decisions. Uh, there are a whole series of these things outlined in, in my book, and it, they were outlined in Seitz's diary. Some of them happened in, uh, later after Seitz left office. Reagan operated uh, in a disengaged way often in his presidency. He set the goals. You used the word inattentive. Inattentive, disengaged. He set the goals. He was a fantastic communicator. My God, when I go look now at some of the videotape of him, he had this uncanny ability to radiate optimism. You look back at that man, and you could see why he was elected overwhelmingly as president two times. And you compare that to leaders today, it's like stunning. Where is that sense of optimism and hope and, and energy that he conveyed? But in the field of national security affairs, it was, less e it was a more uneven performance. Uh, and so I think, you know, George had a tendency to be very loyal and respectful of the people with whom he worked and under whom he served, Nixon. Look, you know, when you look back on the Nixon presidency, there, there, there's a, the Watergate scandal. You can't escape it. And yet, when, when Schultz retired, he wrote this uh, incredibly flattering letter to the president, uh, thanking him for the opportunity to serve. No criticism whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, and with Reagan, you look through George Schultz's correspondence with Reagan at the Hoover Institution Archives at Stanford, you know, it's all flowery, flattering stuff back and forth. I think, you know, it, he had a hard time, I believe, sometimes reckoning with the weaknesses of some of the people he worked with. Did, I think if I counted correctly, he threatened at one point or another four times to resign over the course of his career under those two presidents. Did he, were any of those in the Reagan? Yes, period? most of them were during Reagan. In fact, one day I asked uh, my research assistant to go back and, because it, it's kind of interspersed in all the records, it's hard to figure out how often he threatened to resign. So she did a careful study of it, and the, it was seven or eight times sure. during the Reagan presidency when he threatened to resign. So he used that as leverage, but, you know, he, he never acted on it. Which, which of those was the most plausible or about well, which he I, felt most deeply? I, you know, I think it was the day he went into Reagan. He was so thoroughly disgusted at the uh, way he had been outmaneuvered and blindsided on some decisions involving uh, American covert military and intelligence activity in Central America. During the Reagan administration, that was a big emphasis. They feared that communism was coming to America's doorstep on the Mexican border. There was Cuba, of course. Then there were the Sandinistas in Nicaragua who were viewed as left wing and sympathetic with the Kremlin. And there was all the upheaval going on in El Salvador that the Reagan administration thought would lead to some kind of leftist government there. And so behind his back, uh, the Reagan uh, hardliners put through a bunch of decisions that the president actually approved. Secretary of State knew nothing about them uh, to increase all of this military and intelligence activity. Uh, 
And so he stormed into the White House one day with a decision to resign. He told the president who the potential successors were. I think that's the closest he came. And, and Reagan didn't want him to resign. By this point, Reagan understood that his presidency would not be a success without George Shultz, so he insisted that he stay. Uh, so George didn't pull his punch, but rather Reagan talked him out of it. Well, Reagan said, I want to accept your resignation. Uh, yeah. Well, of course, he still could have resigned, <laughs> but he, he, he refused to. Uh, interesting. So a member of the audience asked the following, uh, Phil, um, and I think this refers to the INF and the Pershing II missile controversy. Uh, did Schultz worry about accidental nuclear war when precise first strike missiles were introduced into Europe in an attempt to bankrupt the Soviets? Well, you know, it was interesting. He was kind of uh, divided about nuclear weapons. As Secretary of State, he believed in the importance of maintaining the American nuclear arsenal. He believed it was pivotally important uh, to get these Pershing intermediate range missiles placed in West Germany because the Soviet Union was putting similar missiles in the Western territories of the Soviet Union. And it was actually, if you look back again at the end of the Cold War, this was a truly pivotal moment when Hel Helmut Kohl, the German chancellor, agreed to have these American Pershing missiles placed in West Germany. And it was a moment that essentially signaled to the Kremlin in decisive terms that, you know, we are here to confront you, we're not backing down. And it registered in a way that I think ultimately affected the, the Soviet thinking about trying to end the Cold War. So at that point, he was uh, happy to see more nuclear weapons put into the field. But under that, both he and Reagan shared a, a, a real concern about the potential for a nuclear war. And uh, when they got to Reykjavik, you alluded to that earlier, it was a snap summit. It was unlike any other previous Cold War summit where there's all kinds of preparation and the, the document ending the summit is negotiated before the two leaders really ever get together. They went to Reykjavik on short notice. There was no communique prepared ahead of time. They didn't know what was going to happen. And Gorbachev drives up with all kinds of far-reaching proposals, which, you know, again, give Reagan credit for this. He went to the Politburo, Gorbachev, and he said, I'm going to Reykjavik. I've got these big, dramatic arms cut proposals I'm taking with them, and we have to reduce our defense expenditures. We cannot sustain them. Reagan gets to Reykjavik with some pretty good proposals, too, that had been developed on the American side, and they're seated at this table in this cozy little room overlooking the sea, the North Atlantic Sea. They're there for two days, and they came so, so close to agreeing to eliminate nuclear weapons. Eliminate? It, eliminate, abolish them, not just reduce them, abolish them. The whole thing ran aground when Gorbachev said, OK, we can make a deal. Uh, but you got to do something to cut back on your strategic defense initiative. And the deal he offered Reagan was not a bad deal at the time. He said, you know, why don't you just agree to limit research on all this exotic uh, defense technology to the laboratory? And Reagan said, no, I won't accept that. Uh, and at one point, at the dr most dramatic moment at Reykjavik, and it was a really dramatic summit. He hands a little note across the table to, to Schultz and says, am I doing the right thing? And Schultz says, yes. So they came very close to this historic agreement. They couldn't agree. The talks collapsed, actually. There, if you go back and look at the photographs, there's this grim photograph of of uh, Gorbachev getting into, uh, Reagan's getting into his limo, Gorbachev is standing there. They both look as if they're at a funeral. Uh, but it turned out that the groundwork that was laid at Reykjavik actually made it possible within the next year to come to an agreement to eliminate those intermediate range nuclear weapons uh, in Europe. There's a school of thought, uh, I associated it conspicuously with your brother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, Bill Taubman, who's written a terrific biography of Gorbachev, right. that the, the Reagan-Schultz uh, outreach to Gorbachev 
went cold or went uh, dormant when George H.W. Bush came in, Bush 41. And that, that the inattention to Gorbachev in the years immediately following Reagan and uh, Schultz's exit from office was fatal for, for Gorbachev. And, and that led to his being ousted as the leader and the Soviet Union collapsing. Do, do you, I know it gets ahead of the Schultz story. Well, you know, it's a, it's a complicated issue. And, and uh, you know, it actually, it is the roots of what Vladimir Putin would tell you was his justification to invade Ukraine. Uh, I don't buy that, but, but that's his justification is as the Cold War was ending, the United States, rather than trying to help Russia recover from communism and, and rebuild its economy, uh, decided to expand NATO to its borders, which they perceived as, uh, Putin certainly perceived as threatening. But to, to go back to the beginning of your question, there, this was a kind of poignant and important moment. George H.W. Bush has been elected president. Gorbachev surprises Reagan and the president-elect by saying he's coming to New York to speak to the UN in December of uh, 88. And so suddenly there's an opportunity for yet another summit meeting between Gorbachev and Reagan with the next president of the United States present. And so they meet on Governor's Island in New York Harbor. Uh, and Reagan and Schultz thought this was going to be a moment when they sort of handed off to George H.W. Bush, who would then continue this momentum to, to dealing with the Soviet Union in a, in a constructive way. But Bush's advisors, particularly Brent Scowcroft, his incoming national security advisor, uh, advised him to slow down, put on the brakes. We think that Reagan and Schultz have gone too far too fast. So there's this kind of poignant moment out on, on Governor's Island where Gorbachev comes over to Schultz and says, how come George Bush is so standoffish? Why isn't he participating in our conversations here? The reason he wasn't participating was he didn't think he wanted to pick up where Reagan and Schultz were leaving off. Uh, and, and Schultz was very bitter about that uh, for the following decades. He would come back to that to me frequently, yeah. that he didn't understand why they wouldn't just move forward with what he had done. And I suppose it's all speculation. Had they picked up where he left off in the spirit uh, that he and Reagan left off and had come to provide massive foreign aid to Russia, maybe history would have turned out differently. But you know what? Let's be realistic. You know, you think if an American president had gone to Congress in 1989 and, you know, uh, and then later as the Soviet Union was collapsing and said, we want to give billions of dollars to, to Russia, they never would have been approved by Congress. Well, you're probably right. Uh... Never say never in these things, but yeah. you're probably right. Um, so uh, let's just talk for, go back to the book just for a moment. Um, you make a great deal, you rely very heavily on the journals or diary of right. Raymond Seitz. You've mentioned him a time or two. Can you tell us a little more about him and what, that must have been a very valuable source for you. A uh, critical source. So uh, one of the things that Schultz did when, he became, did when he became Secretary of State, unlike a lot of his predecessors, was to lean heavily on the, on the uh, diplomatic corps of the United States for his top aides assistant secretaries and other top posts, rather than bringing in a bunch of outsiders. So he turned to Ray Seitz to become his executive assistant. And, and Seitz had been an American diplomat for years, had served in a number of foreign posts, had worked in the secretaryship under Secretary Kissinger. He knew Washington. He was a very keen observer of Washington. It was a very smart move by Schultz to select him. Ray starts to keep this diary, and it very quickly grows into an astounding uh, piece of archival history about the United States. He never tells Schultz he's keeping it, because as he, Seitz later told me, the day I told the Secretary of State I was keeping this diary, it would become the property of the State Department and the American government. 
and it would be stamped top secret, and it would disappear for decades. So he kept the diary. He wrote it out in longhand on a steno pad. He then, uh, his assistant would type it up. He would dictate it. She, she would type it up. He would expand a bit on it as he was dictating it. The day he left his job, eventually he became US ambassador to Great Britain, he walked out of the State Department, put it in his briefcase, 800 pages, single-spaced, sitting down there at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. It's now being opened up for historians for the first time. Yeah. Schultz, so you're the first writer Schultz seen gave it. me exclusive access to yeah. it, and it's really the making of this biography. Now, the excerpts that you quote are very, yeah, very penetrating a, and often yeah, quite It's an extraordinary it. document. And very frank and candid. Very yeah. unvarnished uh, inside account of the battles going on in the Reagan administration. So we have another question from our audience here. And I suppose it's an inevitable question. Did you discuss the Theranos scandal <laughs> with him? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, it was uh, the unavoidable topic uh, late in George's life, sadly so. Uh, and uh, he and I had a, uh, a kind of come to Jesus sort of moment over this where I had to ask him about uh, his relationship with Elizabeth Holmes and his involvement in Theranos. Uh, it was a, a, a very tough interview. Uh, you know, when you're a journalist, you have to do tough interviews, and in my view, when you're a biographer, you have to do them. And, and I would just add here that when he invited me to do his biography and gave me access to his papers, including the site's diary, I made very clear what my uh, intent was. I said, George, it's your life, but it's my book. Uh, and I will have complete control over the contents, and you will have zero control over the contents. And he agreed to that. So we're now seated in his conference room at Stanford University, and I'm saying, you know, how did you get involved in Theranos? Once it became clear that Theranos was a, a fraudulent enterprise, that the technology was not uh, uh, working, and your grandson told you this, who was working at the company at your suggestion, how could you not disown Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos? He sat there, we went over this for almost an hour. He would still not disown Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, I, I, to this day, I don't understand it. My, the best I can do to try to explain it is, I'll be blunt about it, I think that he was intoxicated, infatuated with Elizabeth Holmes. I mean, she was in her, her 20s, he was in his 90s. This was not a romantic relationship, obviously, but it didn't mean that he wasn't infatuated with her. Uh, I think at the peak value of Theranos stock, the stock that she had given him was, and, and a few shares that he had also bought, was worth more than $50 million. That may have influenced his thinking. Uh, and the last reason I think he stuck by her was this sense of loyalty he had. Throughout his life, it began on the battlefields of World War II in the Pacific, when it's a life-saving thing. If you, if you don't have the back of your Marine colleagues, you and they may die. He carried that through his life. He remained loyal to Nixon throughout Watergate. He remained loyal to Reagan, even though he, Schultz, knew that the Strategic Defense Initiative was uh, technologically a, 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 a fancy, couldn't possibly be achieved. And sadly, he stood by Elizabeth Holmes when her fraud was exposed. Mm. He also, to my knowledge, at least correct me if I'm wrong, never took public voice about the candidacy of Donald Trump for the presidency. Well, he, he did, but it was in a kind of uh, 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 anemic way. Uh, I talked to him about Trump as the fall of 2016 played out and Trump was you know, running for president. Uh, and after a while, it became clear that 
Schultz thought that Trump was taking the re his beloved Republican Party, George Schultz remained a, a Republican through his life, that Trump was t turning it in into a darker direction. Uh, but he wouldn't speak up about it. And one day I said to him, you know, I'm your biographer. You know, people will read about you, I hope, for decades to come in my book. Don't you have something you want to say about Donald Trump as he's running for president and this anti-immigrant uh, policies, all the things that he stood for at the time that were abhorrent not to me necessarily as an American citizen, but to the Republican Party that George Shultz had been a, a loyal member of for his whole life. I think that sort of made an impact on him. So the Friday of Labor Day weekend in 2016, he and Henry, Henry Kissinger issued a statement saying they planned not to vote for either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, but would be happy to serve for either candidate, whoever was elected. And he remained largely quiet on the sidelines during the Trump presidency, even though privately he became increasingly alarmed about the Trump presidency. Well, we've come to the end of our time this evening, so our thanks to Philip Taubman, uh, the author of In the Nation's Service, The Life and Times of George Schultz, for joining us uh, today here in San Francisco. We'd also like to thank our audience for uh, watching and participating live. And let me just say, we should all be on the alert for Phil's next book, <laughs> jointly authored with his brother Bill, Bill and Phil, uh, which will be a bi biography of another major figure in the history of the last half of the 20th century, Robert McNamara. So thank you, Phil, and thank all of you. Thank you.